for some hiding uh, in documents that, uh, in redacted documents that have been submitted. And then on our Uh, Mr. Stewart, are you aware of the House of Commons uh, motion which was passed in the House yesterday regarding um, you? Mr. Chair, Honourable Member, yes, I'm aware of the motion that was passed in the House of Commons. So there were two components to the privileged motion passed yesterday uh, requiring you to attend uh, through you, Chair, Mr. Stewart, to attend the bar of the House after question period on Monday. Uh, to receive an admonishment to be delivered by the speaker as well as to deliver up documents ordered by the house on june the 2nd so that they may de be deposited with the law clerk and parliamentary council uh, mr stewart do you uh, intend to comply with both components of that motion on day um mr chair honorable member um the motion is with respect to monday and for those of us who are working on the covid pandemic that's a while from now um, I'm aware of the motion and what it requires uh, of me and uh, I look forward to uh, Monday as it comes uh, are, are you aware that um, Parliament is supreme and that your opinion is immaterial in this regard uh, mr. Point chair order, mr. chair mr. Connell on a point of order go ahead Sorry, Mr. Chair, the relevance of this questioning, given the fact that this meeting is either on supplemental estimates or uh, COVID, and suggest, Mr. Chair, that you rule that the member stick to the topic of the meeting. Uh, I certainly would recommend to all members that they st stick to the topic of the meeting, and uh, I will uh, invite uh, Ms. Rumpelgarner to carry on. Please. Just, just on that point of order, Chair, before my time starts, uh, the supplemental estimates do cover a wide variety of expenditures, including uh, the matter that's at hand here. So it is, I believe it's within scope, and I will start Sorry, again. Mr. Chair, then on that point of order, can uh, Ms. Rumpelgarner specifically point out it, what section of supplemental estimates she's referring to in her questions around the motion in the House? I'd like to be able to refer to it. So can she point to it? Uh, thank you, Ms. O'Connell. Um, we do allow quite broad latitude here, but I would uh, invite uh, Ms. Rumpagarner if she wishes to, to respond. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Stewart, do you intend to comply with both components of the privilege motion passed yesterday uh, as ordered by the House? Point of order, Mr. Chair. I've asked. I've asked that the specific. Ms. Rumble Gardner said she was referring to. Point of order, Chair. This is debate. The supplemental estimates, and I'm, I asked that she refer to it if she's going to continue in this line of questioning, and I have not received that answer. Thank you, Mr. O'Connell. Uh, I, I did ask uh, Ms. Rumble Gardner if you wish to respond to that question. Uh, I. I Take it, you do not. Uh, I point of order, though, Chair, that, uh, that is I'll debate. Up, excuse me, I am speaking. Uh, I will leave it up to you to respond or not. Um, but, and then I will uh, start your clock and uh, carry on with, the, with your time. So go ahead as you as you will. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Stewart, do you intend to comply with both components of the privilege motion passed before the House of Commons yesterday, as I described earlier in my question line? Mr. Chair and Honourable Member, I replied to your question when you previously posed it. Uh, you did not actually have a specific response, yes or no. Well, um, Mr. Chair and Honourable Member, I answered the question. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you, I would argue that Mr. Stewart did not answer the question. Does he intend to comply with both components of the motion passed in the House yesterday, yes or no? I think the question has been asked and answered. I would ask you to move on, please. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Stewart, do you uh, intend to deliver documents ordered by the House on June the 2nd uh, to be produced so that they may be deposited with the law clerk and parliamentary council under the terms of the motion provided in the House of Commons yesterday? Mr. Chair and uh, Honourable Member, um, I'm not going to be able to respond about intentions for Monday at this time, uh, but I appreciate the question. I will point out that uh, previously uh, similar motions have created a tension that is difficult to manage between the requirements of the Privacy Act and the Security of Information Act. Uh, 
Did you both uh, of thank which you, place chair. limits on the ability to provide documents of the nature being thank requested? You, thank you, Chair. I will point out that the Speaker of the House of Commons ruled on the point that was just made and ruled against that argument in his ruling in the House yesterday. Uh, he also pointed out that the uh, National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliament Act yeah. makes clear that despite its composition, the body is not a committee of parliament. That's why the ruling was made. So uh, going forward, Mr. Stewart, do you believe that your opinion on this matter supersedes an order of parliament and the ruling of the Speaker of the House of Commons? Point of order, Mr. Chair, once again, where's the relevance? And if she'd like to point to the section of the supplemental estimates, I'm still waiting. Thank you, Ms. Ms. O'Connell. Uh, I would also uh, uh, request of Ms. Rempel Garner that uh, that she do, do let the uh, witness answer as, as he uh, deems best. So please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I've outlined relevancy already. Uh, so I'll ask Mr. Stewart again. Do you believe that your opinion on this matter supersedes an order of Parliament and the ruling of the Speaker of the House of Commons? Point um, of order, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. O'Connell on a point of order. Mr. Chair, this isn't the Canada-China committee where the motion originated from. So if the member is not going to stay relevant, I'd ask that you rule that sure. you point out the section she's referring to. This uh, is sure. the health committee where we're dealing with supplemental estimates. Thank sure, you. on this point of order. Um, Ms. Rempel Garner on the point of order. Yes, um, the National Microbiology Lab, as well as the research contained therein, it has a significant amount of funding, which is material to these estimates. Um, I could point to numerous other things, but I would ask that you rule on whether or not you think that my line of questions are in order so that I, my clock keeps being uh, cut off. Um, I, I have lost a lot of time. I would ask that you rule on this so that we may the committee may decide whether to sustain your ruling or not. Mr. Chair, point Mr. of order. Chair, I have my on, hand up. On the point of order, uh, Mr. Davies, who we haven't heard from yet. Go ahead. Thank you. I, I think it's important to, to clarify what we're doing today. First of all, we are here to discuss the, the supplementary estimates, and there is historically an incredibly wide berth, uh, not only to ask anything that's in the estimates, but even what's not in the estimates. Second of all, we are also here, uh, these witnesses are here pursuant to the uh, motion of this committee, which is to deal with matters uh, that deal with the government's handling of COVID. Now, the, um, the, uh, the issues at the, uh, that were before the House originated over concerns raised at the Winnipeg uh, laboratory that was dealing with viruses, and there's a clear connection between that and potential um, interference or involvement. In, um, in compromising Canada's COVID research, et cetera. So there's, abs there's, there's nexuses between this line of questioning and the, the purpose that, of which we heard today. What I'm concerned about is um, Ms. O'Connell has interrupted, I think four times now with the very same uh, point of order and you have ruled on it repeatedly. And I, I think there's a certain point where uh, a, a member who is being repetitive and vexatious and not respecting the, raising the same point of order repeatedly, given your ruling, uh, it interrupts the flow of questioning. Uh, and I think it's a privilege of every member here to have their six minutes uh, to do with what they will. And there's no question that these questions are, are relevant. Um, so um, I would ask that, uh, um, all members not interrupt each other uh, on particularly when their rules their their um, points of order have been ruled upon and they have have not been they've not prevailed on that rule of order or point of order pardon me you're on mute Ron sorry uh, thank you Mr. Davies Ms. O'Connell you wish to also speak to this point of order Thank you, Mr. Chair. And while I appreciate Mr. Davies' intervention, uh, my ability as a member to raise points of orders, and as any member does, is a privileged point that we all have. And Mr. Chair, to that, if the member mentioned herself that she was referring to a section of the supplemental estimates and then did not cite it. So 
I appreciate Mr. Davies' comments, but Ms. Rumble Gardner opened that door and then did not provide the facts uh, or the receipts to back up her comments. And Mr. Chair, my final point on this argument is the fact that Ms. Rumble Gardner suggested that she has questions about the microbiology lab that would be relevant to the supplemental estimates and spending, which I would agree that that is uh, in bounds. However, her entire questioning to Mr. Stewart has been in relation to a motion in the House, a procedure if he will comply, and she hasn't asked a single question actually on the lab. She has simply asked questions about a procedural motion that came Sure, from this is now debate and, and we are wasting time. To do. Excuse me, I have the floor. You have not been recognized as uh, from the chair. On a point of so, order, Chair, Madam, on this Mr. point of chair, order? Uh, please don't interrupt the member. Well, She's, the floor, she has a the floor point on a point is of order. That if, the, if Ms. Rumpel Gardner would like to speak about the lab, by all means, go for it. However, I have raised a point of order based on the fact that she is not speaking about that. She is speaking about a procedural matter being dealt with in the House. And I would ask that that be ruled on. That has nothing to do with supplemental estimates as wide of a scope as the chair permits. Uh, thank you, Ms. O'Connell. Ms. Uh, Rampel-Garner, did you wish also to respond? Uh, are you ruling that my line of questions is in our order or out uh, of order? Uh, uh, well, I was going to ask if you wish, I asked if you wanted to respond to, to the, the points. However, I will, I am prepared to rule. Uh, well, I, I agree that uh, we generally give wide latitude asking about estimates. Uh, I believe that the microbiology lab is relevant. However, uh, I take Ms. O'Connell's point about the matter, uh, direct line of questioning that uh, you referenced, Ms. Rempel Garner, is about a house procedure. It's not, it's, it's far too peripheral. I would ask that you, uh, uh, I would rule that it, this line of question is, uh, is not relevant. And I would I ask challenge you to- challenge ruling. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rumpelgarner. Uh, so the question is to the committee, shall the, uh, shall the decision of the chair be sustained? If you respond yes, then the decision of the chair is sustained. If you respond no, then, then um, you know, the matter is determined to be by the committee to be uh, in order. So I will ask the clerk to conduct a vote. Please go ahead, Mr. Clerk. Ms. O'Connell. Yes. Mr. Killaway. Yes. Mr. Polowski? Yes. Ms. Sidhu? Yes. Mr. Van Bynen? Yes. Mr. Barlow? Absolutely no. M Mr. Dantlemont? No. Mr. McGuire? No. Ms. Rempel Garner? No. Monsieur Lemire? No, Mr. President. Mr. Davies? No. So Mr. Chair, five uh, yeas, six nays. Thank you uh, to the committee. Uh, so Ms. Uh, Grandpa Garner, you may continue with just, your just line Just on a of point questions. of order, Chair. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, Grandpa Garner, on a point of order. Thank you, Chair. Can you just let me know what your clock says? M my clock says 441, but I, I think- I have three uh, just okay. Don't interrupt me, please. But I will give you, uh, I, I think that we lost a, a, at least a minute. So I will give you uh, that it's, uh, uh, we'll call it four. And um, and so you would have two minutes left. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Stewart, did uh, anyone from the Prime Minister's office, any staff or anyone from the Minister's office or any staff or any other uh, staff advise you on whether or not to comply with the House order made yesterday? Um, I've had no conversations with anybody in the Prime Minister's office on this topic, um, and uh, I have not had discussions with my Minister's office with respect to the intent to comply on Monday. Uh, do you believe that your opinion on this matter supersedes the Speaker of the House of Commons? Mr. Chair and Honourable Member, if I can have the time to respond to this question uninterrupted, I would like to try and take it on since the minister has, uh, the member has asked it several times. Uh, go I'd ahead. say yes, I would, I would ask for a yes or no on this. Uh, the minister, or the, the witness may answer as he deems appropriate. Uh, you Again, have Chair, asked... I have a minute and I've been interrupted many times. So I would like to know as it is material if the if Mr. Stewart believes that his opinion supersedes the will of Parliament on this matter, 
You've asked, you've asked, you should expect to hear the answer. Mr. Stewart can give the answer he is, that is, uh, he feels appropriate. Um, I will make allowances for time, uh, but please go ahead, Mr. Stewart. Thank you. The way the question's being framed is difficult to respond to. I would invite a different way of responding be considered. Uh, I am a career public servant, and as a career public servant, I have to follow the law. There are two laws that limit my ability to act. Nothing in the motion has amended the law to date, so it creates a difficult situation. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, it's not about my view of somebody else. It's about the advice I've received about what I'm allowed Thank to you. do under law. Uh, Thank Mr. Stewart, you for you the do question, real, Honourable Member. You do Mr. realize, Fugani. Mr. Stewart, that um, the law, that Parliament makes laws and also has the ability to determine what documents are produced. So I I guess I would just say that you are you now in a position where you are interpreting the will of Parliament as opposed to Parliament? Is that what you're suggesting to the committee? Mr. Chair and Honourable Member, that was a very excellent way of structuring what you're asking. In fact, Parliament does make law and I am required to follow that law. The House of Commons motion does not amend the law and that's been the challenge in this file. Thank you, Honourable Member. Mr. Ampagarna, you have 30 seconds left. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Stewart, you do realize the Speaker ruled on sections of the law that were applicable to the House order and found a prima facie breach of privilege. So what you just said is out of alignment with what the Speaker of the House of Commons found and what then Parliament ruled upon. So do you find that now you are making pronouncements upon the will of Parliament as opposed to obeying the will of public uh, of Parliament, as you said in your role as a career public servant? Uh, Mr. Chair and Honourable Member, uh, what I've been trying to say is that the law places obligations on me and the advice I've received uh, helps me stay within compliance with that law. Uh, I don't have opinions of the nature the minister is ascribing to me regarding the speaker and his ruling. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Ms. Rempel-Garner, please go ahead, uh, five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Mr. Stewart, in my uh, colleague, Mr. Davies' questions, you said that you were re referring to the usual sources and providing or, or getting information regarding uh, whether or not you will be complying with the House order. Who are the usual sources? Uh, as I mentioned, the Department of Justice. Uh, great. And when you, uh, when my colleague, Mr. Davies, uh, raised a matter, you suggested that it was you were looking for immunity. Did you want to explain? bound on what you meant by immunity? Um, Mr. Chair and Honourable Member, what I was trying to do was disentangle. Um, I have to um, abide by the law and... Um, are you, are the, you saying that the House order is unlawful? Um, Mr. Chair and Honourable Member, uh, the acts of Parliament that I'm following were passed by the House and the rest of Parliament, uh, and they have the full force of law, and I you have to act consistent with them. So, Mr. Stewart, you do realize that an order of Parliament is also lawful, correct? Um, Mr. Chair and Honourable Member, um, you are parliamentarians and know better than I do whether the House of Commons is equivalent to the totality of Parliament. Uh, my understanding is an act of law is passed by the Commons as well as the Senate, et cetera, in a more extended process than a motion, but I don't know that area of expertise and you may know more than I do. Uh, thank you, uh, through you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Stewart, as Mr. Davies mentioned, the order requires the production of documents to the law clerk for redaction. Um, do you believe that the law clerk is not sufficiently equipped to redact the documents? Um, Mr. Chair and Honourable Member, um, in order to make a determination about who a classified material can be handed to, normally we would look to the level of protections that they have around the material before we transfer it. Um, that would be my response. And so you're, you're, you, you do believe then that the law clerk is not uh, sufficiently able to redact documents via an order of Parliament? Uh, Mr. Chair and Honourable Member, if you look at the motion and the previous motions, you will see no guarantees in any of the wording 
that the materials provided will be managed in a way uh, managed in a way that's consistent with the security uh, required for the level of classification that they have. So I have no information on that front. Actually, I can't answer your question. So it is, in, uh, Mr. Stewart, it's within your opinion that the speaker was wrong in ruling a prima facie uh, prima facie case of privilege. Mr. Speaker and Honourable Member, you've asked me several times uh, for an opinion about the Speaker's opinion. This is not an area where I'm expert and I have tried to avoid even appearing to have such an opinion. Uh, so I would say, as I have previously, I don't have an opinion about that. Uh, thank you, Chair. I will now pass the floor over to my colleague, Mr. Don Tremont. Um, thanks. Uh, let, let's go back to uh, some of the questions that, uh, that Mr. Lemire was actually asking uh, to the Minister about the PNPRB. Um, so from what I, I understand from your answer is that the regulation changes will happen on July 1st. Is that correct? Uh, we're still reviewing um, the PMPRB. As you know, it's been delayed uh, twice uh, because of the uh, obviously uh, state of a pandemic and the incredible focus of the pharmaceutical industry on responding to the pandemic. And we're assessing uh, right now the next steps on the PMPRB. How are those assessments taking place? Is there a little consultation going on? People writing in, I mean, what, what's, how, how are you doing that? A variety of different uh, ways, including speaking with the industry and other stakeholders. Okay. Um, has it been considered within it, uh, some of those recommendations that have been provided by patient groups? Uh, Mr. Lemire just spoke to a number of those uh, requests, uh, changing the basket of countries, uh, particularly taking out uh, uh, the U.S., taking out uh, Switzerland, I believe, was the two that were, were, were creating a challenge, um, trying to find a way to implement the regulations in a more, in a more sort of a longer period. Uh, and then trying to find a way to actually have consultations, true consultation between PNPRB and the patient groups. Well, actually, those consultations have been ongoing and uh, regular. In fact, I've met with a number of patient groups myself, as well as uh, a number of other stakeholders, including industry stakeholders in Innovation Medicines Canada. So those, those are ongoing conversations, I would say, that uh, my office and I have on a regular basis. Um, in those discussions with the patient groups, um, did you apologize a little bit for the, the work that PNPRB did, did uh, especially when it came to certain patient groups on uh, trying to find a way to uh, make them seem being bought out by the, uh, the pharmaceutical companies? The conversations I've had with the patient groups have been extremely respectful from both sides. Uh, I would say that the patient groups have understood that the government uh, at the end of the day is trying to make the very expensive medications in some cases for their particular illness group. Uh, more